full stack of technology and even the latest version of Eclipse E4 has an underlying EMF model of all the parts, the high level parts that are in the workbench and as you edit that model the user interface actually updates. So this is sort of a graphical way that I show people what eCore is about. You can look at this sort of Venn diagram notation and you can think of all these sort of spaces as the sort of problem domains that these languages describe, what you can do with Java or with UML or XML schema. And there's a lot of overlap between those things. You can see this sort of common intersection. They all have objects that support inheritance. These things have properties and relationships between them. So eCore is trying to capture that common intersection between all those things. But it also tries to capture some things that are specific to UML, like bidirectional references, or specific to Java, like full support for generics, and some things in XML schema, like substitution groups and mixed XML content. And those arrows between these things represent transformations or generation steps. So EMF can take any one of these representations, convert it to eCore, and from eCore convert to the other representations. So you can think of eCore as sort of a, a hub in an airport system where you can connect to everything else by going to the hub and getting to the other places. So here's more of an instance way of looking at the same thing. All these things are different representations of a tree model, so nodes with labels that contain children and have the ability to navigate up to their parents. And if you look at something like this, a lot of people are obsessed with differences. It's human nature to spot subtle differences. And yeah, all four of these things are different, and a lot of people are obsessed with one of them being better than the other. Each one is appropriate depending on what you're trying to do. If you need to serialize to XML, an XML schema to describe the serialization is very useful. If you need to manipulate Java instances, the Java representation is useful. So better to look at that and see a tree model than to look at that and say there's four different things and which is better. So EMF is cool, but it's still not one big happy party. And the main reason for that is the poor editors. The tools are barely adequate, they're kind of a pain to use, and that's often what sort of taints people's point of view about modeling. Um, there's also a divide between programming and modeling, so you generate the Java code, and then you can go and modify the Java code, and we support merging so that you can switch between modeling and coding, but the turnaround between those two make you feel a little less than productive. So that's where Xcore comes into the picture. In its essence, Xcore is a textual syntax for eCore, so we're using Xtext to define a grammar, and that induces a language, and we map that language onto eCore. Um, what we get immediately by using Xtext is a cool editor, a very much a JDT-like editor with completion and so on, and I'll be demonstrating that tool in action. And we're also trying to make this feel a little bit more like JDT. In the old days, you used to have to run the compiler and remember to run the compiler. In JDT, you save the file and you don't think about dot .class files anymore. They just appear and we do the same thing with Xcore, generate the Java files behind the scenes. So there's essentially no generator model at all. With EMF, you have an eCore model for the structure and you have this decorator generator model that lets you define how it maps onto Java, that's merged into a single artifact with Xcore. And most important of all, you can specify behavior now, so you can define the bodies of operations, you can define the logic for derived features, and so on. So here's a simple um, example of the tree model, of the Xcore syntax for it. So you can see it's very concise like Java, and you can see that you can write very concise expressions for expressing logic. So here, this getChild method um, finds the first child that has the matching label. So instead of talking more about it, I'd like to show the actual tools in action. So we'll start out here with an empty workspace. This is basically what you'll get if you install the SR1 version of Juno and install the Xcore tools into it. 
So we'll start by, so we'll use the standard library example. So I'm going to create a simple model for our library. And we want to start by creating a project to hold that. So we have a, a fancy wizard, well, not so fancy, but a convenient wizard for creating a project like that. So we'll call it org example library and accept all the defaults. So this is essentially a Java project, a plugin project. And from the little X, you can see it has the X text nature. It's also configured so that it has dependencies on the core, on the simple runtime libraries that we're going to depend on when we write the code. Um, any existing project you have, you can configure to be in this form, so you don't have to use this wizard. So there's a model folder to hold our resources. So we don't have a nice wizard for creating an instance yet. We just create a file with the right name. So we'll call it library.xcore. And it creates an empty file and opens up the Xcore editor for it. Now, an empty file is not a valid instance. So we need to start entering some syntax. So I hit Control Space. And it knows it has to start with the package keyword. So it filled that in for me. So we'll call it org example library. And we'll doc define a class called library. And notice if I go here, it does the JDT-like things of suggesting the proper keywords for the things we want to start. So we'll call it library. And then we want to define the name for the library. And again, I hit control space. It suggests all the data types that start with S. And we'll call that the name of the library and save it. So one of the things we tried to do is make the built-in data types have the aliases that match the Java data type names for those things so it feels more Java-like. But from the hover, you can see this is a reference to the e-string data type in eCore. So most people know EMF as sort of a code generator. But in fact, all of these models can be dynamically emulated. So I've told it to create a dynamic instance in this particular file. And then it opens up that resource. And I have an instance of a library in there. If I double click, the properties view comes up. And I can set the properties on this guy. So I can give this a name, Vancouver Public Library. And if I save that, I can show you what the XMI looks like. So it's a simple standard XMI serialization with the library object in it. And you can see we use a schema location so that when this file is processed, it knows where to find the schema. In this case, it's an XCore description of the XML. And it uses that to interpret the file. So you can see here that XCore resource got loaded. The model got read, and that was used to process the rest of the file. OK, so we want to define some of the other things that will be in our library. So we'll define a class called book. And we'll have a string for the title. And we'll define a class called writer. And we'll have a string for the name. Let me maximize that so there's more room. And then libraries contain books. So we'll define that containment relationship. So, so far, what you see, it looks exactly like Java with some simple classes. This is the first case where you'll see some of the extra syntax from eCore. So we can say it's a contains relationship of type book. We can specify the multiplicity like this, so zero or more books. Or this is a shorthand notation for it, so it makes it look a little like the array notation. Um, we do completion on the field names as well, so because it's multi-valued, it suggests books. And then we can do a contains relationship from, for writers as well. And we'll call those the authors of the library. Now, EMF supports this notion of bidirectional references. So given a book, you might want to be able to determine, oops, container, what library contains it. And, we, and a container relationship has to be the opposite of a containment relationship. That's why we have this 
um, error here until we specify an opposite. It's not complete, not valid. So we would do that with the opposite keyword and then with control space it suggests what the valid features are for that relationship. And we do the same thing here. Container, library, name it library, set the opposite, and pick authors. And you see how both ends of the relationship are set up automatically? So the opposite of the opposite has to be the feature itself. So it did that completion for you. So if we go back to our library instance now, because we've defined these containment references, we can create a book and we can create an author, a writer in the author's relationship. And those things have properties. So the book's title I can call Under the Dome and I'll make the writer be Stephen King. And you can see how this containment relationship is represented in the physical nesting in the XML. The book instances are nested within the library instance. So now the books and the writers themselves are interrelated. So a book has a reference relationship or refers to writer and that's multi-valued and we'll call those the authors of the book and similarly the writers write certain books. And those ones are opposite as well. So if some author has written a book, that book's author is that writer. So it suggests the name and it completes those bi-directional references for us. So given that, I can go into my instance again and now there's a relationship between those two things. Now notice when I click on the drop down here, it actually takes quite a while for the drop down to come out because the reflective editor is very aggressively visiting all reachable objects to populate this menu and you see all these resources got loaded into the resource set as a result. But there's only one object out of that whole collection that satisfies the relationship. So I can set the author of the book to be Stephen King and if I go to that writer I can see that the books he's written are under the dome. So these bi-directional relationships are automatically populated on both ends and that doesn't just happen in the editor, this fundamentally happens in the data structures. So there's a get books method on, a, on an author and if you add a book to it and go to that book and look at his get authors list, that object will automatically be placed there. So we also support things like enumerations. So I could define an enum book category and define a few types, science fiction, horror, and so on. And then I could define, oops, my old F1 thing. We can define a feature of type book category. We'll call it book category. When we save that and go back to the reflective instance, then on a book, there's now a book category feature and in the drop down are my choices of enumeration. So, so far everything I've shown are basic things you could have done with the reflective editor, with the structured editor. Um, I'll show you a few things now that you couldn't do with the structured editor. Um, suppose for writer we wanted a special feature for the first name and that would be a derived feature of type string first name. And we can actually define how that's implemented. So I'll check if the, if the name is not equal to null then I'll create a, a variable of type int called index and I'll do name dot index of the string with space in it and then if the index is not equal to um, minus one 
sorry, not equal to minus one, then we'll get the substring of the name. Name dot substring. Zero comma index. So notice that all the kinds of navigation you expect work. So when I'm on this substring method and I hit F3, it navigates me to the string, um, the method in the string class. So this navigation, F3 navigation, both works within the file and navigates to the Java resources. Um, and this is, works dynamically as well. So yes, discard my edits. So if I go to Stephen King and look at his properties, you can see the first name has been properly calculated. And if I change his name, you see that property updates as well. So everything you see, not only are sort of EMFs, model objects dynamically interpreted, but all of the bodies, all of the logic you write in XSpace are also interpretable. Let me show how an operation is defined. Because I got started late, I'm going to run slightly over time. Sorry. We'll blame the keynote running over time and the technical difficulties. Um, so I could define a convenience method on library. We do that with the op keyword and we'll call it book. And basically we want to get the book given a title. We want to get the book instance with that title. So we'll call it book and we'll pass in the title. And the way we'd normally write something like this in Java is like this for book is a member of books. And then we check if the books um, title is equal to the title we have here. Then we return the book. So that's how we'd usually write it. Now, because we're writing with XSpace, it has type inference, so we often don't need to declare the types of variables. But given that we're using XSpace, there's a much nicer way to write this. We could use some of the um, extension methods. So we could take the books and we could use this find first method. And then we could use this idea of a lambda. This is something Java 7 will have in it. And we'll say if it, and it is this implicit parameter that got passed in. So this is iterating over all of the books and passing in an argument called it. And we check that the title matches the title. And if we change that and go back to our reflective editor, you can see that's computing the same results. So that's some of the power we have here. We're leveraging XSpace, which is also what underpins the new Xtend language. So all of the cool things you see in Xtend are things that you can expect to see in Xcore eventually as well. Um, because I'm running low on time, I'll skip showing how to define your own data types and show a little bit on, on the integration with the generated code. So something that I've not been showing here is that every time I save, the, the, the um, code is getting updated here. So you see, if I go to library and I add a method foo and save it, you can see foo is immediately generated as a result. So it's a little bit like JDT with sort of instant compilation. Also, if you look at the properties view, while you have something selected, it actually is showing all of the properties from the gen model. So you'll notice right now we only generate the model project, but if I go to the properties and tell it that I want it to generate um, a, t a test project, so org, example, library, test source, you'll see that gets converted to an annotation. So that's how all the gen model stuff is done with annotations. And I save that, then you'll see the test projects get generated. So everything you could do with sort of the standard gen model artifacts, you can continue to do directly with Xcore. Another very handy feature 
if you hover over an object, it shows you all of the generated artifacts that come from that object. And if you click on one of those things, so let's look at, um, say we want to see what's generated for this method. We can pick the implementation class and click this little navigate button and it shows you the code that's generated from that thing. So you see it's generating this anonymous um, function instance and the logic that's inside that um, lambda is written inside of that. So another thing we get for free as a result of, of having those links from Xcore to what's generated is support for refactoring. And that's the last thing I'll show here. So I can do Alt-RR and choose a new name. So we could rename him to author. And if you counted how many artifacts are generated from this thing, there's on the order of 25 things derived in the generated code from the name author, the methods in the factory, um, constants in the package, methods in the interface and the implementation and so on. So what this is doing under the covers is essentially 25 different Java refactorings. So you get the standard Java refactoring warning if you refactor a class with a main method. And if you bring up the final view, you can see not only does it refactor all the references in the X core, but it also refactors every single use of writer in all of your generated code and of course also in all your downstream handwritten code. So this truly integrates X core and modeling with the activity of programming. It essentially makes it seamless and one and the same. You can call out to any Java stuff and what you generate, what you specify here, you can use in your Java code. So we've tried to make this sort of a seamless experience to bring modeling to those people who think modeling is all about drawing diagrams and using forms and basically being tied down by poor tools. So if you'd like to find out more, um, there's a wiki with information on it. Um, everything I've showed you, almost everything I've showed you is there in SR1 and the nightly builds have new features. If there's things broken, things you'd like to see, open bugzillas and I will try to make the tools even better than they are today. So I can take a few questions, but I'll give you time to set up while I'm taking those questions. Yes.